Okay, this is the uh, the next of the Route 6 um, Google Plus Hangouts. Ask us anything, we're calling this. Although currently we only have uh, <laughs> colleagues joining us um, for this one. Um, but um, uh, you'll find this on the Route 6 blog. Uh, everybody's welcome to contribute. And uh, today we're hoping to go over a couple of things. Um, uh, colorimetry, TV colorimetry, particularly in light of a new piece of equipment we've purchased, uh, a Klein KT-10A colorimetry probe, which allows us to do a lot more than we've previously done. We can do OLEDs and projectors and such. Uh, but I'm just going to go once around the table. Um, uh, joining us is my good colleague uh, Matt Ward, who's from home, and you look like you're muted at the moment, Matt. So uh, speak to us. Well, I just uh, think it, it may be sensible to keep it muted while uh, while other people are speaking and saves any any trouble. But that, uh, that's kind of wise. No. That's wise advice for life in general, really, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> And also down the bottom there is, is is Mr. Dave Skaggs again joining us from home. I think it's it's work from home Friday today. <laughs> um, uh, Rupert, our illustrious leader, is also around, um, but it looks like yeah, I'm uh, wrestling with my camera. Okay, right. <laughs> We've got a very handsome still picture of you, Rupert. So uh, and uh, and uh, <laughs> head of Route Six Tech Support, Chris Bailey, is also with us. But again, it looks like he's muted as well. He doesn't want to talk. So uh, and we've lost Rupert. So we're going to crack on. No, we still can't hear you, Chris. So uh, sort it out, mate. Because when we come to you, we'll need to. <laughs> um, so that's, that's better. The first thing uh, I'm just going to screen sharing mode, and I'm going to drag down um, uh, a browser window. Um, and I'm hoping uh, you guys can see that browser window. There we go. Um, are we? Can everybody see that? Um, I'm, I should be just sharing a, a browser window of the Route 6 blog, yeah? I'm seeing a very, very zoomed in bit. Okay, no worries. Uh, so there, there we go. We have a channel on YouTube now. If you just look on YouTube for Route 6, you'll find um, uh, Ask Us Anything. And there's last, the last one we did. Um, we talked a lot about audio loudness. Um, some quite good stuff in there. Um, and, and, uh, and, of course, there is the Route 6 blog, which I've uh, got up on screen at the moment, um, where you can find uh, all the kind of text stuff we write about, um, you know, how to make your avid do this, uh, including more kind of in-depth stuff. So I encourage everybody to go and take a look at that. Um, but the thing I wanted to open with was was um, uh, the whole kind of colorimetry thing. Um, I've got up on screen at the moment um, some training notes that I did, uh, and I'm showing um, uh, a, um, uh, a a spectrum uh, of of a CRT. So kind of old technology, the kind of thing that we did television with forever. Um, but uh, this is um, what's what you get from a CRT for wideband response. As we all know, CRTs like LCDs, like plasmas, are tri-stimulus devices. So they reproduce uh, red, green, and blue, and not a full spectrum of, of sunlight. But hey, that's the way the human eye works. Up in the top right there, I've got a, 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 the response of the human eye, nicked from Wikipedia, uh, you know, all the way from 400 up to 700 nanometers of wavelength with the reds, the greens, and the blues marked. And, and then the big graph is, is a... Um, is a waveform of of what a CRT does, and so consequently, there's a mismatch between those two, um, and the way that um, manufacturers typically get around that is to um, wait and bias the response of their display technology, so that the electron guns in a CRT, um, such that. Um, uh, they match as best they can the the RGB tristimulus response coming off a um, uh, coming off a CRT to the human eye. Uh, and in the past, in the analog days, when we had only had analog monitors, that was a, a called a matrix. It was a set of transistors and resistors that did it. Uh, nowadays, it's more likely to be a one D LUT contained within the monitor that does that mapping. But that that that's the traditional problem of of how you make a color probe work with a display type. Um, so typically there are two kinds of colour probes. Um, there are um, uh, what we would call photometers, uh, and they're things like, well, the kind of things we've used for many years, um, the Philips uh, 5639 probe, which you know has been around since the 80s. I was using it at the BBC in the 80s, uh, and it's a suckered uh, thing that sits on the front of a CRT and, and picks up uh, the light coming off the front of the CRT and allows you to... Um, do a proper, precise measurement of colour and light levels coming off the front of a CRT. But it is only appropriate to a CRT because of precisely the thing we just mentioned, um, the whole business of, of metamerism and the fact that um, 
uh, you know, the manufacturer of, of the probe has matched the metamoristic characteristic of the probe, the tristimulus probe, to the CRT. And in fact, you know, when, when LCDs became more common, uh, you know, Philips, in fact, then bought out by DK, brought out an LCD version of the probe, and we've been using those for, for several years to calibrate LCD displays, as, um, because, again, it uses the same metamoristic characteristic as the uh, LCD display. Uh, but if you wanted to go all the way up to a device that could do any kind of display technology, it was uh, something like one of these, a Photo Research PR655, a spectral radiometer, um, which does a wide band measurement. It measures all the wavelengths of the light, not just centered around the tristimulus values of red, green, and blue. Uh, but these are 20,000 pound devices, as opposed to photometers, which are typically seven or 8,000 pound devices. Um, but you know, if you want to do every kind of display device, the, 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 you either arrive with, a, with, with several um, uh, photometers or uh, it's a spectral radiometer. That's until um, uh, Klein um, introduced this innovation whereby they, um, if I can bring up the, uh, uh, the right page from the Klein manual. Um, ooh, so here we are. Klein, Klein introduced this thing called the KT-10 probe. Um, the K10T probe, which K10A probe even, which uh, does this very clever thing where they've essentially matched the metamerism of their probe to the human eye. So this is a graph here where you can see the response of, of the red, green and blue of a human eye with the, the response of the Klein probe overlaid on top of it. So Klein have essentially said, we're not going to even try and match uh, what what probes, what, 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 what the display types do, we're going to match the eye. And then our probe will have this, a similar metamoristic failure to what the eye does. And that's all that's important. It doesn't matter that you've got things mathematically correct. It matters that they look the same. And that's traditionally how we match two different monitors to each other. We match them so they look the same. But should you stick two different kinds of photometers looking at those monitors, you'll get different readings. But Klein have taken the view that if our probe matches what the human eye does, then at least we're, we're, we're um, able to um, do exactly what the eye does and we can produce similar matches to the eye. And so, you know, although the Klein is an expensive gadget, it's a kind of £6,000 probe, it's not a £20,000 um, uh, spectral radiometer, which have their own problems. A spectral radiometer has to be left to warm up um, it's a very sensitive gadget. You can only do things in a darkened room with lots of time to spare. Um, and so the Klein for us is, is, is just a fantastic uh, compromise between those two things. And in fact, we had a nice session at the Route 6 workshop where we hired a couple of, um, a couple of different types of monitors, LCDs, OLEDs, and we spent the morning uh, sort of training and, and measuring um, and, and really marvelling at how well the Klein dealt with those different display technologies. And you can read about it all on the Route 6 blog. There's a couple of recent um, uh, entries about colorimetry. So I'm going to turn off screen sharing because that just gives us feedback on the uh, on the uh, display. Yes, no, everybody's looking horrified. Um, <laughs> um, and no, screen sharing turn off. How do I do that? <laughs> yeah, there we go. Back, let's turn it off. So, um, uh, you were with us, Matt, and you were with the Skegs. Any any thoughts on 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 our sort of strategy now with um, with with colour? Uh, well, I thought after the session, uh, I thought it was a black art to begin with, um, but then after going through and actually understanding it a little bit more, it seems to be a lot more sensible. And this is sort of work through it logically. Um, it's, it's it's very easy to kind of. Really. You're right about it being a black art, and lots of colorists kind of propagate this this idea that, that getting monitors the correct color is a black art. Um, a recent at a recent facility, I I had to match a plasma to an LCD, and I got them as close as they could be. And I, I'm kind of pretty good at matching monitors. I did lots of camera racking in my time, and lots of matching monitors in linear suites where you've got a record and a preview monitor, and you've got to get them the same color as the, otherwise the the client kicks off, um, and I got these two monitors as close as they would go, and then I had to spend half an hour with the colorist telling me, nope, bit more blue in the blacks, bit more green in the whites. And I didn't make a single adjustment, I pretended to, and by the end of the half hour, he was very happy. And clearly, you know, he could see the differences that weren't really there. Um, one of the things that you mentioned, Rupert, was, was this whole business of colorimetry going awry when you inject, um, when, when you go through uh, um, uh, transcoding with, with QuickTime.
Uh, you're on mute, Rupert. Unmute yourself. Hello? Yeah, 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 we can. So QuickTime and transcoding and color spaces and gamma. Yeah, so um, uh, that's something that I'd like us to touch on in a future podcast because I think it needs a little bit more preparation with respect to kind of how you fix it. But it is certainly, from me, I think this is the area in which most operators, so most editors. Are... And he's gone. <laughs> he shouldn't be doing it with a mobile phone. <laughs> have, have any of the other guys come across that where, where, where you send something through QuickTime and uh, something gets skewed? Yeah, well, um, at, at, at Strong Room Post, Stroke Air Post, in the, in the early days of, uh, or when Colour was uh, just taken over by Apple, was it Final Cut Pro 7's studio? We, um, we, we built a little grading room round Colour because clients were screaming about it because Apple had made so much fuss in the press. And, um, and lo and behold, uh, our workflow Final Cut Pro Colour and then back to Avid to do final online um, uh, was a nightmare. Um, in the end, the, the easiest solution we could find at the time was to slave the Avid over 9-pin and uh, and play it out of Final, final Cut. Uh, down, a, down a HDSDI cable um, across the facility. And, and because this is also back in the early days of file transcodings where everything was supposed to be a happy file-based delivery and uh, not... Everything was ha- supposed to be very happy to be moved between machines, but of course the transcoding always took hours. Um, in the early days, ProRes to DNX, and we actually found it was much easier to, to spin it down a cable. So the classic case of relying on HDSDI as the correct lingua franca. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, and because it was the only thing we could, you know, we could guarantee that. that the, the, the color space on the output would, would match the color space on the input, if you like. I have a fantastic little tool uh, that you can inject at any sort of tra- into any transcode process that reveals what typically goes wrong. Um, again, forgive me, I'm, I'm going I'm to do a screen share again, and and you'll probably see you'll probably see a, a bit of video how while I just sort this out. There we go. Uh, come on, come on, you swine. Right, so I've got up on screen now uh, a website called uh, Belle Nuit Montage, and they're a, they're a, actually a French post production company, and they have this. Swiss. They have Swiss. Are they Swiss? I think so. So they have this. They have this chart that they make freely available, and I've used an awful lot, which which basically shows up all the problems. In fact, if I, if I, if I drag in a, uh, a proper screen grab of it, you should be able to see that. Um, and it shows everything. So if you've got a mismatch between 601 and 709 color transcode, so, so you've turned HD pictures RGB YUV using the SD standard, i.e. you've used the 601 numbers rather than the 709 numbers or vice versa, um, these color stripes here do different things. Um, if you've got gamma wrong, or if you're using full RGB ranges rather than studio swing levels, um, then um, strange stuff happens here on the, on this scale. And there's lots of other things on here. Uh, so, so again, uh, you, you know, if 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 those two colours there aren't merging, you know you're going the wrong way around between full l- levels and studio swing levels. Um, if if that matches. Uh, you, you know, but, but, and the same thing down in the blacks. You know, if that black doesn't match that black, you know you've done the wrong thing in that respect. Um, and there, there's a, a there's a sort of a diagonal um, sort of um, marker that appears on here if gamma is wrong. And it, it's a very clever test chart that sets, that shows up everything to do with static images if you've got it wrong. So if you're doing a, a quick transcode through QuickTime or, or there are problems, you know, this is just the thing to use. You can download it from their website, you know, in various resolutions, standard def, high def. And the way I, can, um, the way I would envisage people using that is not entirely dissimilar to the way that we used bars back in the TV day. Indeed, um, yeah. You put it, on the front of your, put it on the front of your timeline in Avid or wherever you're on, and then you export it. As part of the export, and that gives you a kind of canary in the coal mine that allows you to kind of spot when you've, um, you know, you've got something going wrong, or at least allows you to characterize what's gone wrong. I'm getting an audio feedback. Are you guys getting that as well? 
I think it's your mic, Rupert. I think it's your phone. It? Okay. Yeah, it does, does seem to go, go and c come and go with you, boss. <laughs> yeah, I think it is. It's, 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 I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to stick my earpiece in. Jolly wise. Let's try that again. Hold on. Let's just mute him there for a moment. Dear me, that was loud. How's that? Yep, yeah, and the, hey. the, the the prize for the late lower third goes to Dave Skeggs. Log in and log out. And does, 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 the, does the prize for the working microphone go to Chris Bailey? <laughs> <laughs> no. I'll take, that, I'll take that as a no. <laughs> Where's my lower third? Do I have to make my own? I don't know if you can do it on a phone, can you? I wouldn't have thought so. I'll have to make my own. <laughs> you have to add the uh, toolbox app, Rupert. Okay. Either that or a piece of card, piece of cardboard held up in vision. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, I've got one. Hold on. Hang on. I'm on a roll now. Yes, <laughs> look at that. The business card. The business card. <laughs> so <laughs> what you are. <laughs> 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 the king thank you very much <laughs> okay yeah, just, just to close off the whole kind of um, little colour thing um, I, wa <laughs> I wanted to, to pop up a, 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 a just a, a, a little um, screen <laughs> <laughs> heavens <laughs> <laughs> right, sorry, Phil. Well, I'm well, taking this with a seriousness, it's true. Well, we're working with children. Um, I was, uh, <laughs> I wanted to pop up the uh, uh, just just a screen grab of um, the results we got when we profiled using the Klein probe um, a Sony uh, PVM twenty five forty one uh, OLED display, which is their current model. Um, you know, everybody wants it OLED monitor. And I have to say, I thought it was fantastic. Um, so again, we're into. Um, Oh, I can actually, I can actually just share. What can I share? I can actually just share the browser window. There we go. So yeah, you should be seeing that. Yeah. Okay, I'll go just, can I just trail the fact, Philly, that we, we, I think I talked to you about going and testing out some August broadcasters 4K monitorage, and we'll probably bring the results of that back home once we've had a look at those. You yes, know, it's absolutely. I mean, it's all interesting stuff, isn't it? And it, it, we'll, we'll we'll throw it up on the Route Six blog, but. Um, if you take a look at this um, uh, color imagery chart here, which hopefully I can make bigger, um, uh, that, that, that was us profiling the Sony monitor against Rec. 709, which is every superhero knows is, is the color space we use for high def telly. Uh, and um, there are the values, you know, if you like your color primaries. But um, oh, can you hear me now? Yes, fantastic. <laughs> we work in technology. Sorry. <laughs> Chris, Chris Bailey and Matt Ward, Route Six's newest parents, struggling to uh, to make their computers work nicely. <laughs> what? Yeah. How's the baby monitor? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, you've gone quiet again, Chris. Yeah, carry on. <laughs> this is why you have such splendidly quiet evenings. Your baby monitor's on the mute as well. <laughs> well, yeah, usually. <laughs> So anyway, back 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 to um, uh, the 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 the, um, the CIE ch t test chart for that Sony monitor um, with um, the Rec. Seven Hundred Nine color space, and you can see this thing has a remarkably good, a remarkably close match. You know, within one and a half percent of exactly where it should be, which you you'd never get that from a CRT, even a even a, a D twenty four or a um, or an LCD monitor, definitely not an LCD monitor. So I was just so impressed Especially a D24. With, yeah, with how well matched. The OLED was, and it didn't take as much effort to get it get it that close. You can see down here that the, the, what they call the black body locus, which is where all white points sit, uh, and uh, and this is the uh, the profile we got off the, the the Klein probe with the Sony monitor. So we were very impressed with that. It was uh, it was a surprise, a pleasant surprise. What um, is the current claim from Sony as to how long it will stay in that state once you've calibrated? What's your expectation as to how often you'd need to come back with a client and have another look? Well, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? The PVM comes with a year warranty, whereas the BVM series OLEDs come with a three-year warranty. And I don't know whether that tells us anything about what Sony's expectations of, of the blue elements are. Although, having said that, the, um, the current model uh, 
PVM OLED trimester um, uh, has got a slightly different blue response to the originals that they launched 18 months ago. And in fact, Klein had sent us a new um, profile to load into our, our probe's head for the new Sony OLED monitors. So it looks like they've had a slight change of technology um, of, uh, of the blue elements of their display. So whether that's because they've refined it enough to, for them to be more longer lasting, because the, the, the currently accepted view is that the blue OLEDs will fail soon. Um, and they'll, they'll, they'll kind of, you know, the monitor will go yellow over time as the blues fail. And, uh, and, and uh, eventually, you, you know, you'll wind up with a monitor that you can't drag into correct calibration, as we can see here. <coughs> So my question really Phil, was more about from an operational point of view, if I'm a colorist and you know, you've popped in and calibrated my monitor, how long should I be leaving it until I phone you know, my friend, you know, somebody to come in and have another check of it? Is it a monthly or a yearly thing or I think yearly or where, where do you reckon the sort of the sweet spot is in terms of checking up on it to make sure it hasn't drifted or doesn't it drift? I mean do OLEDs not drift? I it, I, I, I don't know. I don't think we have enough experience of it yet um, uh, to, uh, t to know, to be honest. Um, uh, I don't think anybody has that data yet, Rupert. It's, uh, the, uh, the issues with the blue are all sort of based on lab aging. So we just don't right. know in the field how long it's going to be before it starts to... So in the face of that, it. what would your... As a, as a chief engineer, Phil, of, of old, where would you kind of set your kind of retesting regularity? Would you come out in three months or would you be happy to leave it longer? Um, I mean, hey. Bearing in mind, you used to do it daily when you were well, at yeah, well, Well, I mean, you know, CRTs in the 80s and the early 90s, you would routinely calibrate them every day if they were being used for, uh, you know, finishing editing or grading. Uh, and that's because, you know, analog electronics drift an awful lot. Now, Sony's innovation in the mid-90s was beam landing, where I don't know if you've ever noticed on a newer model CRT, if you look at the top of the display, you can see three very thin red, green and blue lines. You ever notice that? Yep. Um, that's, that's a technological beam landing where they where the first scan at the top of the display is done off the shadow mask, or rather still hits the shadow mass, but it does, it's not where the phosphors are on the display. And it means that the monitor can make a measurement of beam response. So it can tell how the electron guns at the back of the tube are aging and the, the, there's a... Um you know, there's an auto gain amplifier that, that tracks that. And so that's why in the mid 90s, CRT monitors all of a sudden got so much more stable. Now, five or 10 years ago, when we were still selling lots of CRTs, um, and we were getting into, you know, calibrating them for people, we sold oh, what, probably 25 to channel five, uh, JVC DTV, the very last DTV series monitors. And, and we made a habit of going and, and calibrating those every six months. And they were stable as anything. And in fact, about Three or four months ago, I was back at Channel Five in in um, in Docklands, where they are now, Northern and Shell, and I did I did some of those monitors that were old friends from when we did their facility in 07 or whenever it was, and they were still pretty stable. They were still pretty much there. So, you know, CRTs went from being quite bad to quite stable just because of that one innovation, beam landing. Um, so. Uh, and every, obviously everybody's very used to LCDs being very stable because what governs the colour of an LCD? Well, it's the colour of the backlight. Uh, and, and the backlights are reckoned to last 30,000 hours. Or who knows how long the LED backlights will last. Obviously, cold um, fluorescents last about 20,000, 30,000 hours before they start going yellow. Um, so who knows how long LED backlights will last? I, I, I haven't seen right. anybody making any claims. So, it's so like an annual, an annual test would be fine. Yeah, I mean, colourists look at them every day. So presumably when they notice them going a bit yellow... But but I I really don't know. Right, so what? Go on, Dave. Um, is it worth mentioning the difference we saw between the OLED and the TFT with the black and the jitter when we were trying to you know do the black? Uh, absolutely. So 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 um, uh, LCDs suffer by being noisy in the blacks. Um, you, you know, we we know that that's been the, the, the sort of the the, the uh, that that's been the um, charge level to LCDs. They're, they're rubbish in the blacks. And the first series of Sony LE, LMD series monitors, which were essentially just rebadged uh, medical imaging monitors with a, uh, a an HDSDI board in them, they were terrible in the blacks. Um, but they got better, particularly with development of better uh, dichroic filters on the front of the monitors and things like that. But they're still noisy in the blacks. And so when you stick your 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 um, uh, uh, DK PM fifty six thirty nine probe at 
when you make it like a 10% or a 50% black measurement off a Sony monitor, uh, an LCD monitor, um, you see you see the the the, 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 um, the little um, uh, indicator jumping around quite a lot, and it's always a bit of a compromise to try and get the blacks correct in that situation. But you're right when when, when we did it with the Klein, the Klein is a bit more sensitive. And the noise wasn't such a problem, but you can still see the noise in the blacks. But the OLEDs were, were splendid in the blacks. You know, there's no uh, sort of noise in the blacks. And, and getting the black colour correct is just a question of looking at the probe and not having to judge it by eye, go back to the probe, judge it by eye. You know, so, so a combination of uh, OLEDs being much more colour consistent all the way down to very dark colours against LCDs and the probe being a bit more sensitive means where we're in a sort so what's of what's the contrast price? ratio difference between an you know the old crt you know d24 what's the contrast ratio of that what's the contrast ratio on lcd and, and now with the oleds uh it, it, with crts it's very hard to say because with the crt the internal reflection within the tube is significant so if you measure if you set up a monitor correctly for black so you use your pluge test signal to get blacks just correct so so slightly blacker than black is invisible and slightly grayer than black is visible and then you display peak white and you set it to whatever your standard is, 80 candelas per meter squared, 100 candelas per meter squared. If you measure the difference in light levels between the blacks and the whites, for CRTs you get truly huge, like 10,000 to 1 contrast ratio. However, if you put up a checkerboard of blacks and whites on the same, you know, at the, at the same time, the contrast ratio falls away to just a few hundred to one because of the internal ref reflections within the tube. That the presence of white on the front of the tube reflects internally within the tube and makes the blacks a lot greyer than they are. So, technically speaking, CRTs have got a huge dynamic range. In practice, they never do. Um, where it matters, right. you, they never do. LCDs are, you know, really good LCDs are kind of, you know, a few thousand to one contrast ratio. Um, and uh, the OLEDs, I, in fact, I measured, I measured the, um, the contrast ratio using the Klein probe. Let's see if I can bring it up. Boom, 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 boom. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Just give me a moment here. Um, the, I, I haven't got the exact figures to hand. I've got them in a file somewhere. But the probe claimed that the, the contrast ratio between blacks and whites on our OLED was greater than 10,000 to 1. So, so very, very good, you know. Very, you know, deep blacks. And what about, what about the client's um, ability to do something like a, a high dynamic range monitor of the sort Dolby is starting to you know, propose as a market solution? Uh, uh, Does that make any difference to the kind of the way in which you would deal with calibrating it, or what, what's involved in trying to calibrate an HDR monitor? You reckon? Uh, well, I mean, you have to remember what, what's. What's the source material we're looking at? It's HDSDI, which worst case is 8-bit, so has a dynamic range of um, has a dynamic range of 100 to 1. No, 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 uh, 250 to 1, or, or, or it's 10-bit, which is 1,000 to 1, or at the very best, it's 12-bit, which is 4,000 to 1 dynamic range. Remember, every bit gives you six more dBs of dynamic range. Um, so. Given that the client seems to be able to operate um, at better than 12 bits of resolution um, in its contrast range, I'd say, well, I have to do some testing, I'd say that the client's probably good for um, whatever broadcast standards can be thrown up on a Dolby monitor. That's probably a bit of a, bit, right. bit, of, bit, bit of a, you know, trying to avoid the question, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so what, what, um, in your opinion, do you reckon high dynamic range is going to bring to the party in terms of monitoring? What, what effect are we expecting? Because I have to say, one of the things I want is about you know, what, what effect it's going to have on the whole post-production process, and it's an area that you know, will bear a lot more investigation. But at first pass, where do you see the attraction of you know, why Dolby heading in the high dynamic range direction with monitors? What is it? That, is it just that you can see the full contrast ratio, where on other devices you can't? Or you know, what, what, what do we think the perceived benefits are going to be operationally from a professional point of view? Well, it's probably worth uh, just de defining what you mean by HDR because you know you can shoot HDR and it looks great even on 10-bit displays. I'm talking about. Do you remember? It's effectively this bright side technology that they bought a while back. Do you remember we showed it um, in Soho when it was a Canadian startup and Dolby bought it and buggered off and came back with it and in them, you know, it's the, the, the grading monitor they used. But they're talking about. Um, I didn't actually get to see it at NEB, but they had it in the back room, and they had a spectacular contrast ratio. So, you know, the, you know, the whites are very, very bright, and the darks are very, very dark. Um, and I'm sort of struggling to understand what the impact is of that is going to be in, in sort of, you know, say, 
professional post. I wondered if you had any thoughts or whether it's too early to talk about and perhaps we should, you know, we should look at it together before we, we sort of discuss that in detail. Have you got that gamut, you know, we were talking about a gamut graph earlier, the Ultra HD, you know, where it uses more of a, the space. I mean, that's similar, isn't it? Uh, I, I do, yeah. So that's you're referring to Rec 2020, which is the yeah. which is the color space for um, uh, uh, Ultra, uh, HD. Ultra HD, yeah. Um, so I'm just gonna, uh, I've I've, oh, I've got it got it on this iPad in front of me actually. Um, I could probably find the PDF if I looked hard. Uh, where are we? Uh, talk amongst yourselves momentarily. Um, stick, it, stick it in Dropbox. Do I put a hat on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Another another comedy hat, if you please. <laughs> Quite a good hat, <laughs> That's ridiculous. There's a, man, there's a man in Google who, who spent a lot of time doing that. <laughs> oh, hang on, I can do eyewear as well. <laughs> okay, so I... Oh, flipping heck. <laughs> Hip, hipster glasses. <laughs> So you should see coming from me now uh, a, a slide which shows um, the gamma of Ultra HD. Uh, so, so the triangle, whereas HD Tele, the Rec. 709 gamma is kind of a little triangle, it, probably half the size of the one you can see there. Um, the uh, uh, the gamut of 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 or the, the proposed gamut for for ultra HD telly is this huge great thing that almost extends out to the limits of human vision. There's still quite a lot of greens and cyans and blues that that can't be encapsulated by it. But this is this is a sort of like an optimistic view to the future because there's nothing yet that can display that color range. The P3 color space, which is digital film, is kind of within here. And the, the Dolby monitor is the only thing that can display that. If you're talking about a monitor, obviously projectors can do it. Projectors tend to have 16-bit uh, bit chips in them, and, and they can get quite a long way out there. Um, but this is kind of like a view to the future. So, so it basically, it's allowing them to define some new color primaries and the new luma transfer function, uh, so that when displays can do this, they've got the maths to match it. So, so that's why um, we're talking about Rec 2020 as, 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 a, as a new color space. Um, but getting back to... expectation, Bill. Is the expectation that the 4K monitors, in inverted commas, that we're looking at are able to do Rec 2020, or do we not expect them to be able to do that? No, I wouldn't. No, is, no most, yeah, of them, most of them can hit 709. Uh, the Dolby monitor can hit uh, P3, uh, but nothing that you can buy at the moment right. can get anywhere close to Rec 2020. Um, and, and therein lies the problem with 4K. You, you know, Not only can they not get um, close to the uh, required colour space, but they can't... Um, um, they can't get um, anywhere near the frame rates that are going to be required by 4K. When you say required, what do you mean? Well, I mean, obviously you were with me at the uh, the, 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 at the, uh, the BFI when we saw that BBC demo. Um, uh, 30 frames a second, 4K, for anything other than very tightly controlled sort of film sourced material, looks terrible. It's no good as a live production format That's for sure. television. Yeah, you, you know, the, the, the difference between the dynamic and the static resolution is so bad that your brain recoils from it. So, um, so, so yeah, 4K's got a long way to come, I think. So that, that's why we're talking about 4K... Because... Sorry, say, say that again, Rupert, we lost you. Say that again, Rupert, we lost you. Lost you again. Other than it being, it's not um, an optional choice. You're, you're, what we're saying is that the reason a UHD is typically 4K 60p or you know high frame rates is there's a good technical reason for that. I suppose is what I'm sort of attempting to clarify. It's not that you know Sony or the manufacturers have decided to wind the data rate up in order to kind of increase sales of expensive and you know large amounts of storage. There is a human eye component to why you'd want to watch 4K at 60 rather than 30p. There's a compelling reason for watching 4K at 120 frames a second, particularly if you're watching live sports. Um, uh, but 4K, I mean, you know, I, I, I struggle to see the difference between 720 and 1080 on my sofa. Um, uh, <laughs> it's, it's the truth of the matter is that, you know, viewing conditions at home don't, don't you know matter really um but i think i think the important thing is that it basically unifies film and television workflows doesn't it from from our industry point of view you know hmm. i was just I, 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 I was just remembering the, the the thing we went to but so what you're saying is if you look at 4k at 30 it's uncomfortable 
Uh, it is for, for live production, for live sports production, things like that. The difference between the dynamic and the static resolution is such that your eye recoils from seeing such beautiful pictures when the camera's locked off to seeing such smeary motion rendition when the camera's moving. Right. Now, we, we talked quite a lot about this in the last um, Ask Us Anything. So um, I, I'll direct, you know, I think people should be, you know, direct back to that. Um, because uh, you know there was one other thing I wanted to bang on about, and then if or if anybody else wants to pick up anything that they that, that, that they've got they've got sort of burning in their minds. Um. <laughs> so there we go. There's 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 the last uh, uh, ask us anything we did on. We did. We did talk quite a lot about uh, about 4K in that. So hopefully right. we we, an, we answered things then. Um, uh, I'll just uh, just for a giggle, I'll I'll, sh I'll show you something else. Um, I'm, I'm in the Route Six Workshop at the moment, and we we are building um, uh, some um, uh, very very long fibre cables uh, for for the FA Cup final for Arsenal. In fact, if I refresh our ca our security camera feed, you can see. Um, you it see, sounds a bit funny, Phil. What yeah, might getting quite a lot of interference as well. Okay, um, don't know, don't know where that's coming from. How's that? Oh well. So there's 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 well, there's Wes and Tony D are uh, our are, are, are wiring heroes, but building some uh, 400 meter fiber runs for Arsenal, and uh, and that's they've worked out quite well. We're quite quite kind of pleased with that. So all the uh, ironically the web coverage for Arsenal, which will be done next weekend. Uh, for their website is all being shot in 4K. Can you believe it? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. So all, all all their live web streaming, second screen stuff is all being shot in 4K because Blackmagic are sponsoring the event, and so they've got they've got four 4K cameras, 4K vision mixer, and all the other facilities required to do this. <laughs> Are they doing it all in 12G? Uh, apparently so. That's why they that's why they need that's why they need the fiber. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so the other thing I wanted to talk about was 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 EDID, extended display identification data, which is something we've rub, we've rubbed up against a few times. Yeah. You've turned into a robot, Phil. Have I? Yeah. 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 Okay, hang on a second. <coughs> How's that? Can you hear me now? Hello. How's that? Hello. No. Uh, Still a robot. Robotic. Mr. Roboto. Domo Arigato, Mr. Roboto. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I can't leave the hangout because if I do, it'll break it. Um, is that any better? Any more joy? No? It's worse. No, no, no. Okay, listen, I'm just going to mute myself um, while I bang on about EDID a little bit. Yeah? Yeah. So... <clears throat> EDID, EDID is is, um, is 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 a, is a data standard uh, that comes down the um, uh, uh, DVI, HDMI, or or DisplayPort connection when a monitor connects to a computer. There's a really good uh, article on Wikipedia about it where you can see the um, you know the, the, how it all works. But the the the, the thing that, that often we fall foul of is is how um, this is triggered. Uh, when when a monitor is connected to a computer, um, traditionally Microsoft Windows, or in fact the Mac does this as well, they look for a uh, pin 16 on the DVI connector and the equivalent connector on 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 HDMI and on DisplayPort. And when they see that pin get asserted, um, it says, "Oh, new monitor has been plugged in. We should do an EDID exchange." And so Microsoft Windows will ask for a new EDID, and um, after that it will. Um, It will um, uh, see if it has to do a uh, a change of um, resolution. If it doesn't, it'll just let things slide. But Avid, uh, you know, everybody's favourite non-linear editing system, Avid will always insist on restarting Media Composer. And no doubt you guys have seen, uh, you know, Media Composer um, throw a wobbler and uh, insist on restarting and ru potentially ruin laybacks and things like that when it sees a new... Um, uh, 
when it sees a new uh, monitor being plugged in, even if it's just the same monitor where the cable's fallen out and, and you've replugged it back in at the back of the, of the machine. Now, obviously, our favourite KVM system that we sell is Amulet, and quite often editors will want to move their um, displays between um, uh, machines, and that can cause lots of problems. Um, uh, so we had Lindy build these little gadgets for us. There's, a, there's the bag they come in, uh, and, and there it is there. It's just a, a DVI back-to-back. We call them the Spoofomatic. You can buy them from Lindy's website, They're kind of a bit less than a tenner each. And that essentially stops uh, the Avid from being able to see when a new monitor gets connected, which is fantastic if your facility is full of all the same size monitors, but rubbish if you've got different size monitors, because now essentially you've muted the computer's ability to detect a change of monitor. So um, that's just kind of one little solution that that that, that um, gets round a problem that's inherent with Media Composer. Um, Media Composer will always try and restart the application if it sees a, a new monitor being connected. Um, we've had several KVM manufacturers say to us, oh, well, our KVM doesn't cause Media Composer to want to restart. Uh, and the, my response to those guys is, well, your KVM's doing the wrong thing because KVMs should alert the computer when a new monitor is being connected. Uh, you shouldn't hide that from the computer because you don't know that they're running Media Composer. They could be running anything. And if you go from a 24-inch monitor to a 19-inch monitor without the computer knowing, uh, then uh, you get nothing. You get no display at all, and, and that's and that's rubbish. Um, I would mention a little gadget, which again Lindy do. It's a little, just a little thing you put in your toolbox, um, and it's it's a little kind of uh, HDMI stroke DVI DisplayPort pattern generator that does lots of different standards. You see there, 1080p at 50. But it will also read EDIDs and display them. So it kind of goes in line with your monitor. You can see there's there's HDMI in, HDMI in, and HDMI out. And it goes in line with your monitor. And it will allow you to read the EDID profile coming back from the monitor. So you can do kind of EDID analysis and detect whether there's trouble. And it will allow you to throw up test patterns on the ED, on, on the display and you don't have to have an incoming display from a computer but you can but you can use it to switch between an incoming feed and a test pattern uh, and 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 you know hence diagnose dvi extender problems edid problems that kind of thing uh, and it's a very cheap little gadget it's like a hundred and something quid you know you kind of have it in your toolbox very good so that was my last bit um that was the only thing i wanted to talk about um everybody else has gone mute or they've disappeared we uh, i think sorry i'm having a disaster here the audio that you were having from you, the uh, tunneling, audio tunneling you were getting. Into, uh... Oh, really? So, what is my audio still bad? No, it's good now. No, it's good now. Ah, okay, jolly good. Okay, so that's me done. I've I've said everything I wanted to say. Okay. <laughs> I'm just going to throw up on screen the. Uh, the page from Lindy's website where you can uh, where you can buy the spoofomatics if you want to, or you can buy them from Route Six. Obviously, there we go. Why is my thing backwards? Sorry, is my uh, name backwards? It's uh, only backwards so that you see now? what everyone else sees. All right, because your picture's reverse when you Cosmic. see it. Okay. So it looks right, Chris. Cool. Certainly does. Chris, what's going on in Route Six support at the moment? What's uh, what's what's challenging for you guys? What's what's troublesome for you guys? Uh, if I could get this round and zoom in, you could see an AS three thousand server with a white blinking cursor, which isn't good. The AS three thousand. This is Avid's new cheaper shared storage machine. No, the AS three thousand is the uh, the general purpose servers, also the interplay servers and the media indexes. Uh, so this is one we're currently building for a customer uh, with interplay central and an extra 128 terabytes of ISIS storage. Um, and I'm having a disaster. <laughs> what? There's no customers on the line. <laughs> what, uh, what, what's the problem, do you think? Uh, probably the boot order, I would expect. I think something's happened. We had, we had one happen on an ISIS um, yesterday, so one of the guys had to go up to Chester to have a look at, at one of the race course, so doing exactly the same thing. So I think it might be a, a kind of inherent problem with with some of Avid's hardware, but um, it could be down to a battery. I've got three more of these downstairs, so hopefully they won't all have the same problems, which I've seen. Are they the kind of thing that they are so specific to the installation they're going to that that you have to build each one individually, or, or can you just image them? 
No, absolutely. You can't. You you shouldn't be imaging them because the the interplay engine has, you know, in theory the the operating system can be okay because it's just um, Server 2008 R2 SP1, but they don't come with Service Pack One, which is really annoying. So you have to put that on yourself. And then each each server needs its own different framework services enabled services disabled it's kind of it's much better off to just build them separately one by one and then um you know kind of keep an eye on them as you go along so i'm just building the general purpose server which will be the lookup server the ntp server and the dns server so um, that, that that will live in addition to obviously the machine that the storage is sitting inside yeah yeah, yeah absolutely yeah there's 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 going to be uh, three separate AS3000 servers. So one as a general purpose server running lookup service, DNS, and NTP. There'll be a second one running as the interplay engine, so the database engine, and the third one running as the dedicated media indexer for the interplay system, and then the ISIS is, is very separate. And this is this is the case if you're if you're running a five thousand or a seven thousand. What's what's the baby the case either way? What's yeah. the baby ISIS called now? Uh, what the twenty five hundred. That's that's a near line and it's biblically expensive near line. Oh, did they did they, did they don't bring out a smaller one than the five five thousand recently? No, no. It's, it's a near line system called the twenty five hundred. Well, it used to be the ISIS two thousand, but it's near line and it's ridiculously expensive. I think they were talking about one of them. I saw um, the new twenty five hundred one model is about one hundred and thirty six thousand dollars. Right, and but 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 this this brings. Nearline storage of huge, yeah, huge, into, huge, huge amounts. Basically integrates into the um, into the ISIS client manager and into in, into the interplay setup. Yeah, so if you kind of have a look down, so there's a 7500 which replaces ISIS 7000, 5500 right. which replaces ISIS 5000, which just gives you bigger storage capacity and more engines, and the ISIS 2500 which replaces the 2000, which again gives you um, higher scalability and more. Uh, more capacity per chassis, and I can't remember how many terabytes off the top of my head it goes to. Dave might remember. Uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a lot anyway. But yeah, they're you know the price of an ISIS twenty five hundred is around about the same price as a seven seventy five hundred chassis. So, kind of mainly aimed at the kind of broadcasters with a lot of money. Whereas the fifty five hundred is basically, um, you know, the price has come down a lot on it, but it's. You know, it's the weapon of choice at the moment for non-broadcasters, really. If if you're a mid-sized facility and you yeah. and, and and you um and, and you have avid shared storage, so a, a seventy-five or a fifty-five hundred. Yeah. What? Why? Why wouldn't you just go for the cheapest near line? You know, so object matrix or or that kind of well, stuff. Exactly. You know, this 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 is the thing. I think the where avid have placed this, it, it ties it ties into Interplay and into the ISIS management console, uh, sorry, ISIS client manager environment perfectly. So it's it's a way to be able to use branded Avid storage, as they like to call it, you know, um, with, you know, to tie into the whole Interplay environment. So there's no kind of third party stuff sitting in there. I mean, we've, we run perfectly good solutions that are third party, as Dave knows very well, with object matrix, um, Zen data, for instance, for you know for deep archive, um, and we've run Isolons as near line, and especially with something called NL Tech, which will basically do the pass through between access and your desired um, yeah. shared storage. So Zen data being a perfect example, and Object Matrix have their own, don't they? Which yeah. which goes between access in the interplay environment and their own storage. So it can be done. It's just you know avid give you that ability in one box but you obviously you pay for the you pay for the privilege greater tech support load if you're having to look after a facility where they've got a mix of object matrix and, and avid sorry i didn't i didn't hear the first bit is it a greater tech support load if if you're having to do if you're having to look after somewhere that's got a mix of object matrix and avid uh, not really um you know the, the if there's if there's issues there's you know there's usually a common problem between them <laughs> but um the object matrix guys you know they're they're pretty switched on same as the zen data guys as far as kind of you know archiving goes it's the the avid one the the 2500 is yet to be seen because we have still yet to sell one and still yet to know i don't know anybody who has one does dave do you know anyone who's got one yeah there's a couple of people over in ireland that have, uh, that have oh really have, yeah who, who are they are they big? Yeah, yeah, no, they're a, 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 a well-known forecaster, yeah. So. Yeah, exactly. You know, they're, they're the only people who can kind of board these, 
it's not the price point in, into per terabyte and uh, what, what you need to make it work within the interface um, uh, setup is, yeah, it's not cost effective for small post production um, or even small, you know, broadcasters, really. Exactly, you know, a, a mid tier kind of facility, you know, I've, it's probably it's something that they'll probably just avoid and go with something else. It's just because of the price point it's at. Um, as I said, and as I said, we've we've had great success with other near line solutions that haven't been avid branded. So you know, we I don't think we'd kind of aim this at anyone but the broadcasters, unless they kind of specifically requested it. I would point might make them think twice. <laughs> I, w I was at a well known TV shopping network yesterday, and um, <laughs> they they had nothing but bad things to say about Spectrologic. Well. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's down. If you could, you could probably hear it from here. Actually, it's down on the bench downstairs. So, oh, really? You've got uh, <laughs> you're, you're maintaining yeah. it as we speak. Yes, you know, it, there's there's kind of questions whether or not this is a Spectra issue or whether it's a server issue. But it does, unfortunately, does point towards Spectra. But again, we've had great success with Spectra, the T50s and the and the larger libraries in other facilities. This, I think, this is just an anomaly, really. You know, the, we've got plenty of clients out there who are hammering. The, the Spectra libraries and not having a single problem at all and you know it's I think it is just an anomaly fortunately but they're the people who have come across it so yeah we're working we're doing our best to um, to rectify it and we're running a complete clone of their solution in our um, in our cave downstairs um, with the shared storage that's also involved um, that we've got from somewhere else and we're going to be pushing about 20 terabytes of data to it over the next week once it's rebuilt which it already is and then um, yeah we can kind of prove that that solution works rather than having to go down a network there it is yeah yeah so 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 I suppose for both of you guys, uh, Skeggs and Chris, when 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 people are starting out and and you know that they want the sort of like the the uh, the cheap but yet all singing all dancing very capable, you know my editing storage, my nearline storage, my archive. What's what's your preferred configuration? With, with shared storage involved. Yeah. Cheaper. Uh well, I mean, it depends. I mean, so you can go for a non-avid branded shared storage, um, and you can use, you know, Media Composer uh, quite happily, and you get there's quite a few uh, manufacturers that do the avid shared file system as well. But then, if you want to make that next progression into, say, an interplay environment, um, currently avid only support qualified avid uh, shared storage. So. Um, if you get to that point, then effectively the storage you've been using by a third party, which could have been good uh, with standalone clients, um, become... There is, there is talk of third party qualification within side interplay, though, isn't there? Yeah, there's talk of it. <laughs> yeah. As it stands, um, if you're the, the purchaser um, of that uh, you know, storage and you need it to last for a good couple of years, um, and if your facility is going to grow and you're going to look at it, then they're looking to start to look at. Um, but yeah, there's, there's some really good um, non avid shared storage out there. Um, DDP being one of them. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, and that does, yeah, your shared, shared storage for, for avid um, also does Pro Tools, which is uh, always a big bonus. <laughs> Pro, Pro Tools is a difficult one, isn't it? Because, because, um, uh, uh, you know, sh sh storage over over blinking, you know, twisted pair of Ethernet for, for for audio. You know, I know you've got a few things to say about that, Matt. Um, well, yeah, I mean, it 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 it, it, it it's it's contrary. Uh, shared storage for audio is contrary to uh, sort of what your initial feeling might be about it. Um, most people think you know, video much higher bandwidth, got to get much more things down there. Um, uh, and and but what people miss with audio is that you have um, uh, timing is much more critical. Those samples have to go out on time, and, and, and audio timing, you know, sonic artifacts are, are massively significant if, if those samples don't get out on time. So you, so your timing is much more critical. You've got a much narrower band to, to get in, and and you and you've got a lot smaller file sizes. So so. You need to shift 
smaller streams but at a more constant bit rate whereas the video storage which actually shared storage is good at is shifting large amounts of data in chunks and that's no good for audio you need a, a much commoner stream but at ddp and i think they originally was, were designed for audio they yeah, actually cracked they were, the yeah. difficult bit first um which is a great you know great asset so um so yeah i mean you know even when the big announcement way back when with uh, you know unity 5 you can stick your protos on it well you can but good luck um you know it'll mount um but no, yeah, the, problem, the problem you've got there is again is is as you were saying with the smaller file sizes you get more files and the file the file and folder count was tiny on a unity it was only 10,000 folders and 500,000 files now if you're using tiny little audio files you're going to fill that up. It's the same as kind of image sequences. Yeah. But I was, I was talking to Bart about um, from Ardis about the DDP and how they, you know, how they got Pro Tools working. Because as far as I was concerned, they must because some you have to kind of order it specifically to be able to do Pro Tools if you're doing, you know, if you've got a huge audio facility house. Um, otherwise, they can do a kind of um, collaboration one that will have video and audio on it at the same time. But um, I was asking whether or not when they make one specifically just for Pro Tools whether they change the block size and they don't so it's the way their LUNs are configured um, which is the key to it really so he kind of didn't go too much into it because you know they, they don't really like anyone kind of in the back end but it's um, yeah I was interested to know whether or not they did change the block size but they don't because Avid's block size is large and you know I didn't know whether they'd made a smaller block size to deal with these smaller files but they hadn't it's just the way they configure their LUNs but it's um I didn't go into too much detail about that. In in in, in the, yeah, I mean that's interesting. But the only thing you lose with bigger blog shows is you just lose and, and running audio on it, you lose capacity. Everything yeah. takes up more space. Um you know, but but you don't really lose the speed. I, it's interesting. I don't know about the lungs thing. I, I I'd like to find out more yeah, about like, it. Yeah. He didn't he as I said he was he was kind of a bit coy about going into that further. But it's it's all about that seek time, as, as I understand yeah. it, you know, for audio, because because you're looking for a continuous stream. You can't just transfer a chunk of data, wait, transfer a chunk of data. Yeah. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much. We've um, just passed the hour point, and uh, I always said that, you know, trying to keep your concentration going for more than that is hard so uh, I thank you all I thank you Rupert if you're uh, if you're still watching this he seems like you've disappeared and um, we're uh, we're aiming to do our next one um, in about two or three weeks time so we'll publish the kind of topics for discussion ahead of time and we're hoping to uh, try and get a bit more contribution from some of our customers as well so uh, jolly good uh, this is uh, route six ask us anything and uh, we'll see you soon <laughs>